It was just a piece of fruit. It didn't seem that big of a deal. So God had said, you can't eat of that tree, but it was just a piece of fruit. And it looked really good. And in the earliest days of creation, mankind took a course, a step towards corruption. And with each passing generation, the corruption got worse. Got so bad that eventually God sent a flood to kind of restart this world He had created. But we still would have chosen the fruit. We still would have, and we still do, walk down the road of corruption. And those who read the Bible know that eventually the corruption must stop. It cannot continue to get worse. Throughout Christian history, people of faith have sought to slow down the corruption of society, the destruction of the human race, all the while knowing that it would continue unabated until the trumpet sound and the return of Christ. Yet we're fascinated with that great and coming day. We look for signs of the return of Christ. We We long for that day. And if we're true to Scripture, we change our lives in anticipation of His arrival. Throughout the last 2,000 years, many of the faithful have believed that they lived in the last days of earth, in part because of these words the Apostle Paul wrote to a young preacher named Timothy from 2 Timothy chapter 3. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with receipt, with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all, as it was of those two men. This is the word of the Lord. The warning which Paul gives to Timothy has throughout the last 2,000 years seemed applicable to the times people have lived in. Not surprisingly, they seem to describe the time we live in. As you read this text, you wonder, did Paul do a time travel thing? And look at what's happening in the year 2019. Is it any wonder that Paul would write and say, in the last days there will be difficult times. The world is corrupt. And it grows more so with each passing year. Eventually, it's going to reach a tipping point which will culminate in the glorious return of our King. 
But in the meantime, the corruption of the world makes life hard. Paul notes four different types of corruption which create difficulty for those living through them. First, we have corrupt affections. The the text says, The last days will be known for their corrupt affections, and corrupt affections will make life difficult. When you read the list that Paul lays out for Timothy, it is easy to believe he's describing our time. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, not loving good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Paul tells us that sometimes people love the wrong things. And when that happens, on a widespread basis, in any society, it makes for difficult and terrible times. Corrupt affections wreak havoc in our lives. The mispaced love infects almost every area of our life. We love science more than we love God. As our love has been corrupted, we have essentially abandoned God in favor of ourselves. We love money because we think that in the accumulation of it, we will be more secure. And yet such security is at best fleeting. Society urges us to strive for financial independence and retire early. The FIRE movement But Scripture highlights the sanctity of work. People love themselves first and foremost, so much so that our society has, in recent months, taken a dive over a cliff, and we are on a slope from which we can hardly stop falling. And so we've legalized infanticide. Why have we legalized infanticide? Because... It's not the right to life that matters. It's the right to your happiness that matters. It's the right for you to make your choices that matters. Have you heard of the anti-natalist movement? Has anybody here heard of anti-natalism? Okay, there's one person who's read the news recently. Anti-natalism is this. It is the belief that you should be involved in the voluntary extinction of humanity, that you should stop having children. And in India, the movement is so strong, it's become its own religion, that it's so strong that, that there's a guy in India who is suing his parents for letting him be born. He did not give his consent in the womb. They did it for their own pleasure. Because they wanted to have a kid. And what he's suing for is he's, he's suing for lifelong support. A lazy bum. <laughs> Where did, you can't make this stuff up. Our society has come to love ourselves, though at the same time hating ourselves. We love pleasure. We love ourselves as though we are gods. As, as people become their own gods, there is a moral collapse. We become lovers of ourselves, not lovers of what is good. There are no rules, there are no absolutes, no restraints. Whatever I have to do to make me happy. Everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. And not only that, but woe to anyone who questions their lifestyle choices. And as a result, life becomes more difficult for everyone. Philosophically, we have become Epicurean at best and hedonistic at worst. To which you're spinning, what's Epicurean? Epicurus denied the influence of God in our lives, and Epicurus actually sought to live a simple life of pleasure, which primarily for him was pleasure in friendships and philosophical discussion. The hedonist elevated that to purely the pursuit of pleasure and particularly 
sensual pleasure. People have become lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure. And the difficulties the world faces because of our corrupt affections multiply. We have pleasure, but no peace. We have sex, but no satisfaction. We have wealth, but no worship. Our affections are corrupted. And in these last days, difficult times will come. Not only are our affections corrupted, but also our attitudes are correct, corrupted. Look at the list that Paul lays out for us. These attitudes, proud, arrogant, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. This is not a list of endearing qualities. I can just imagine, you know, sitting down with a, a suitor of my daughter's and saying, okay, are you proud enough? Could you just have a little more unholiness in your life? I haven't seen enough heartlessness in you. Everything listed here is something the opposite of what we would want for our children and our children's spouses. Each of us, however, know individuals who have embraced some of these vices as though they were virtues. When you look at what's happening in our society politically, you can see the dramatic slide towards towards these corrupt attitudes, the language which is used on social media. There's a good, I think a good argument can be made that you just stay off of social media because the attitudes which are projected on social media so often are encapsulated in the list that Paul states right here. It's reckless. The lives which we project into our living rooms in movies are quite often absolutely unholy lives. Pride has taken the place of shame when it comes to sexuality. In times past, there was an understanding that you remained faithful to your spouse and you never spoke with pride of your sexual conquests. You know, gentlemen don't tell. While we live in the most affluent country in the world, vast swaths of society are ungrateful for the blessings bestowed upon us. Gridlock in government is the standard rather than the exception because our pride won't allow us to see good in others. You don't like the present president? He's stupid. You don't like the last president? Well, he was stupid too. We don't discuss issues on an even ground. We just say, well, my way is better, and I can't listen to your way. Whatever you recommend is wrong. It's all about winning a personal battle rather than doing what is right. And society suffers because of it. The great divide we experience as a society flows out of our corrupt attitudes, attitudes which seem more and more apparent with a serious student of history will tell us is destructive to society. The more you study history, the more you recognize these attitudes destroy societies. In these last days, difficult times are made more difficult because a society without reference to God is a society which sinks into pride and arrogance and ungratefulness and unholiness and heartlessness and slander and treachery and conceit, doing anything they have to and saying anything they have to in order to get ahead. We have corrupt affections and corrupt attitudes and actions. Out of the corruption of our hearts flow actions which are also fully corrupt. Paul continues in his list uh, at a time when people are abusive, disobedient to their parents, lacking self-control. And yes, I understand that I was just as disobedient to my parents as my kids were to me. And you were probably just as disobedient to your parents as they were to theirs. Kids have always been disobedient to their parents. But I would suggest that the animosity towards parental authority seems to have grown. There is a, a kid in St. Louis who is suing his parents 
for being born white. He has suffered from white privilege. He probably wishes that there had been some genetic engineering that while he was in the womb, his parents would have paid to have someone come in and mess with his DNA so he could have come out a person of color. But disrespect for parents. In Israel, there are a host of young people who are suing their parents for what they call wrongful life. Israel has one of the most liberal abortion policies in the world. And if you are born with a disability in Israel, you are approached eventually by lawyers who suggest that you should sue your parents for not aborting you. Regardless of the love that they've poured into you and cared for you, we have such a disrespect for parents and a disrespect for life. Difficult times are coming. Children are not just disobedient to their parents, they are antagonistic towards them. You can't make this stuff up. Actually, I read an article about that guy in India who's suing his parents, the uh, antinatalist, on, who believes that you know, we ought to have voluntary extinction of the human race. And, and he said, yeah, it's a, it's a publicity stamp, but I, f- I fully intent on carrying it all the way through to the courts. In the last days, times will be difficult. We are certainly experiencing difficulties due to corrupt affections, corrupt attitudes, which have a tendency to lead to corrupt actions. And actually, I realized that earlier I said we had four points, but I merged those last two corrupt, effect, corrupt attitudes and actions into one for those of you that are taking notes. The difficulties of our society are often masked by a society which works hard to make it appear that everything is fine, to make it appear that things are going along well. And those corrupt appearances are another mark of the last days. Paul mentions in his text the appearance of godliness and the appearance of learning. Verse 5 of our text says, People will have the appearance of godliness but deny its power. In the last days, as people turn away from God, paradoxically, they will become more religious not less religious. They will just become religious in a different manner. Instead of a supreme being, their God will be Mother Earth. That's why the voluntary extinction of humanity movement is there, because humanity is a purge upon the earth, and therefore the answer, their religion, is to get rid of humanity. They have not yet quite taken it to the extent that Hitler took it, but it could very easily happen. We've got to stop having babies so that in a generation we die out. In the last days, people turn away from God, but they seem to become more religious. Religion will become more popular as we approach the end times because we are seeking a refuge in a world that has increasingly lost its way. And so people will ask the right questions, but they will follow the wrong answers. It will be religion for the sake of religion, not for the sake of knowing Christ. Well, they'll join a church or some religious organization, attend services, they'll read books, they'll do good, they will feed the poor, they will embrace the immigrants, they will bleed for any cause in the name of religion. But they won't have transformed hearts. They will deny the very power they profess to believe with the life they live. 
It will embrace a postmodern religion that allows them to do anything they want, believe what they want, live the way they want, as long as it makes them happy. They will take passages of Scripture, and they will simply say that doesn't apply. God didn't know what he was talking about. A religion which isn't bound by those outdated Bibles, by those rules that have been set out by the Most High God, because the religion of the last days will simply say they were culturally relevant. But in our culture, we can do this. A religion of form without substance, a religion of affirmation without faith. In the last days, faith will be rare on earth. Rare enough that Jesus asks in Luke chapter 18, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The appearance of godliness while denying its power is destructive to our ability to live out our faith and to lead others to a genuine relationship with Christ. But it's not merely the appearance of godliness which will plague society in the last days. Paul also speaks of the appearance of knowledge, of appearance of learning. Our text, 2 Timothy 3, 7. These people are ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we live in a time when everyone can become an expert because almost all of us know how to Google. And you can read, read something on Wikipedia. We are filled with opportunities to learn. We are often encyclopedic in our knowledge. And this is one of the things which makes the game show Jeopardy so much fun. Do, 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 do. What's the question to the answer? We match our knowledge against those competing each night. Someone suggested that it seems as though we are learning more and more about less and less until finally we know everything about nothing. When you couple these two corrupted appearances together, you have a recipe for spiritual disaster. For it is possible to continue to learn the facts of faith without embracing faith itself. It is possible to have incredible Bible knowledge and not experience a transformed life. We value education. For many, it is learning for the sake of learning rather than for the sake of being transformed. We have the appearance of being smart. And the appearance of being smart and of being well-educated is corrupt. You've known me long enough, for those of you been in the church as long as I have, that I actually have my Doctor of Ministries degree. I believe in education. But after having received that, I realized that that Doctor of Ministries, that D-Min, can become a demon. Because we so value a degree that we don't let ourselves be transformed. It's one of the reasons I don't encourage you to call me Dr. Johnson. Because I don't want the appearance of education without the reality of transformation. What the world needs, rather than people who are ever learning, is people who have a knowledge of the truth, whose lives have been transformed by the Word of God. Only then will we break out of the appearance of godliness into the transformation of Christ-likeness. So Paul starts this passage with a warning that in the last days there will be times of difficulty. Corrupt affections, corrupt attitudes, and corrupt appearances. And as I prepare my messages, I come to the end, I, I often have these letters I just put in there to remind me. It's Y-B-S-W. Yeah, but so what? For 2,000 years, the, the church has believed we're in the last days. What difference does it make to us? How do we handle this? Unfortunately, time's not going to let us get into this too deeply, but I do have a couple of quick suggestions, and next week we're going to delve into 
how we handle living in our last days. But Paul does give us a a significant hint at the end of verse 5. As he describes these individuals who openly have corrupt affections, corrupt attitudes, and corrupt appearances, he says, the end of verse 5, very simple, three words, avoid such people. Is that hard to understand? Can it be even more clear than that? Avoid such people. When you are with people and they exhibit the attitudes of this text, lovers of self, lovers of money, pride, uh, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, and not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, avoid such people. Don't. Hang out with them as your primary friends. Now, obviously, if we're going to impact society, we at least have to have some contact with with society. But if we spend time with the pigs, we're going to smell like pigs. Avoid such people. The end times are coming. We may be very well in the end days. The description here, I go, wow, how can it be anything other than now? But the trumpet could sound any time also. And in the meantime, as you observe society which is in shambles, come together in a fellowship of believers with individuals who stand against the traits listed in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because the strength of the church of Jesus Christ is found in our unity, in our ability to hold on to one another and to that which is right and good and pure and upright. Avoid such people. That's Paul's beginning advice. He's actually got some pretty good advice coming up beginning in verse 10, but you're going to have to wait till next week for that. Let's bow together. Father, I ask that you would help us today and every day, to be careful who we associate with in order that we might stand as a beacon of light in a society which is plunging into darkness. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.